Okay, uh, greetings, uh, let us uh, get started with today's class. So, a quick recap of uh, where we are, you know, like we are looking at the uh, vehicle uh, powertrain and uh, we saw that uh, uh, what were the uh, ideal requirements as far as a powertrain is concerned, you know, with regards to vehicle performance and what were the shortcomings of an IC engine with respect to that and that motivated the requirement of a multi-speed gearbox, okay, and a move-off element like a clutch. So, in the previous class, we looked at the uh, construction and operation of a clutch. So, today we are going to look at uh, the construction and operation of a uh, gearbox, which is typically used in a manual transmission. So, if we uh, look at a gearbox and a gear in particular, so if we consider a gear pair as a block and we provide a torque T in to that gear at a speed of omega n and T out is at output torque uh, and the speed at which the output shaft rotates is <laughs> omega out and let us say eta t is the uh, sorry n t is the corresponding gear ratio then the definition of n t is as follows the gear ratio or the transmission ratio uh, n t is defined as n t equals omega n divided by omega out. Okay, so this is the definition of the uh, gear ratio n t. Okay, so it is a ratio of the uh, angular speed of the input to the gear pair to the uh, angular speed of the sh output shaft from the corresponding gear pair, okay. So, that is how the uh, gear ratio is uh, defined. So, we will uh, start, we will shortly see how to make use of these gear ratios, you know, like in uh, meeting vehicle performance requirements and also we will figure out, you know, like given a set of vehicle performance requirements, you know, like how do we determine the gear ratios, all right. So, that is something which we will look at. Now, if you look at uh, the types of gears that are commonly used in uh, automotive applications, um, broadly <coughs> spur gears and helical gears are uh, popular. So, let us uh, look at them, okay. So, so this is a uh, simple uh, schematic of a uh, spur gear. So, we can see that you know there is a pair of gears and in a spur gear the main feature is that the, the teeth are cut parallel to the axis of rotation. So, if this were the axis of rotation of the gear, we can see that in a spur gear. the gear teeth are cut parallel to the axis of rotation. So, as a result it is uh, relatively simpler to manufacture, but however, you know when uh, two gears mesh with one another what is going to happen is that like due to the way in which the teeth are arranged, there is going to be a sudden contact between two teeth and this may result in significant noise particularly when the gears are operated at high speeds, okay. So, the spur gear may become noisy when operated at high speeds. 
So, although simple, uh, the level of uh, noise and vibration may increase with the uh, uh, operating speed. Okay, so that's a limitation. So, what is the what is the alternative? An alternative which is uh, popular is the uh, helical gear. So, what is the helical gear? So, in a helical gear, one can observe that the teeth are cut at an angle to the axis of rotation. So, when two teeth, uh, two teeth of the corresponding gears, you know, like uh, they essentially approach each other to mesh with one another, the engagement between them is more gradual due to the manner in which the teeth are cut and oriented. So, as a result, in a helical gear, the noise levels are reduced and consequently they are much more quieter when operated at higher speeds. Okay. So, helical gears have teeth cut at an angle to the axis of its rotation. So, the engagement of the teeth is more gradual. So, consequently much quieter operation okay, when compared to spur gears. Okay, the, so, that is the <coughs> advantage of helical gears, but uh, there is a trade off right. So, because of course, helical gears uh, uh, manufacturing it is going to be more challenging compared to spur gears and secondly, uh, when we are using helical gears, we need to use uh, thrust bearings right to support the corresponding shaft. Why? Because due to the manner in which the teeth engage with one another, there will be an axial force right a component along the axis of rotation that needs to be supported by means of a uh, thrust bearing okay when a helical gear is uh, helical gear pair is used this uh, axial thrust can be cancelled out by using what are called double helical gears where you have uh, teeth of opposing orientation on the same gear but of course they become very expensive and complex you know like to use. So, helical gears are very popular of course, they are they have to be used along with thrust bearings. Okay. Used with axial thrust bearings. Okay. So, to uh, support the uh, force along the axis of rotation. So, <coughs> just uh, sticking to the type of gears, depending on the size of the input and the output gear pairs, we can have various types of uh, uh, gear arrangements. See for example, let us say I am sticking to this schematic. Let us say this is the driver gear and this is the driven gear. Okay. So, then we can immediately see that uh, the size of the driver gear is smaller than the size of the driven gear. So, consequently what can we say about these uh, relative speeds of rotation of both gears? The speed of the driven gear is going to be slower than that of the driver gear. right? So, such an arrangement where the driver gear is smaller than the driven gear and consequently the speed of rotation of the driven gear is lower than that of the driver gear is what is called as an underdrive gear arrangement. Okay. So, the definition of an 
under drive <coughs> gear is that the driver gear is smaller than the driven gear. Okay, in an underdrive arrangement. So consequently, the speed of rotation of the driven gear would be lower than that of the driver gear. So, this implies that what can we say about the gear ratio for an underdrive gear? Please recall how it was defined, right? The gear ratio is nothing but the uh, essentially the uh, speed of rotation of the input gear to that of the output gear. So, here in an underdrive gear arrangement, the input gear or the driver gear is rotating faster than the output gear or the driven gear. So, the gear ratio is going to be greater than 1. Okay. So, in typical multi speed gearbox used in road vehicles, the by and large the first gear, second gear, third gear are all underdrive gear arrangements. Okay. So, where the gear ratio would be greater than 1. Now, the complement of this is what is called as an overdrive gear. So, as the name indicates, here the driver gear is larger than the driven gear in size. <coughs> For example, in the schematic, if we swap the driven gear and the driver gear, we get an overdrive gear <coughs> arrangement. Okay. So, here the driver gear is going to be uh, larger in size than the driven gear. So, obviously, the uh, speed of rotation of the driven gear would be higher than that of the driver gear. So, this implies that for an overdrive arrangement, the gear ratio would be less than 1. So, in most road vehicles uh, with a multi speed gearbox, uh, if one uses a 5 speed gearbox or a 6 speed gearbox and so on, by and large the 5th gear, 6th gear are all overdrive gear. Okay. So, we will see uh, how to get their numbers and what is the role of these underdrive and overdrive gears when we match the transmission to vehicle performance requirements. Okay. But this is the definition of underdrive and <coughs> overdrive gears. Okay. So, now if you look at uh, manual transmissions from a broad perspective, The basic idea is to uh, transmit the energy from the prime mover to the wheels, you know the clutch essentially connects the engine to the transmission, right. So, that is the first step which we uh, looked at in the previous class. Now, the energy which is transmitted from the clutch plate is brought forth into the transmission or the gearbox through an input shaft because if you recall from the previous class the clutch plate had splines at the center right those splines are mounted on corresponding splines on an input shaft to the gearbox so now what happens you know like once the energy comes to the input shaft of the gearbox so in typical uh, uh, manual transmission you know like if we look at the evolution of manual transmissions we started off with what is called as an unsynchronized transmission. 
of course, <coughs> this was the earliest version. So, what is an unsynchronized transmission? Let me draw a simple schematic to explain. So, let us say we have an input shaft and an input gear. Okay. So, this is my input shaft and that is essentially rotating at some speed. Okay. This is connected to the clutch. Now, what happens in an unsynchronized transmission is the following. The output gear or the gear on the output shaft has to be moved along the axis of the output shaft okay, for it to be engaged with the input gear. So, this is the output shaft. So, if I have to engage the gear on the output shaft with that of the input shaft, what I should do is that like I have to move this gear, slide this gear on the output shaft along the axis of the output shaft and make it mesh with the input shaft. Okay? So, this was the earliest form of uh, transmission which was used and this is called as an unsynchronized transmission and obviously one can realize the difficulty right in uh, yeah, achieving this engagement why because the input shaft and the output shaft are going to be at by and large at different rpm right at different rotational speeds before a gear engagement is made then what will happen we need to ensure that the driver adjusts the clutch and the throttle appropriately so that they can engage this two gears which are rotating at different speeds in general before they are <coughs> meshed. That is going to require a lot of skill and it can also potentially cause clashing of the teeth before they mesh properly and at high speeds it becomes even more difficult to do. Okay? So, these were some limitations of unsynchronous transmission. So, what happened? We went to what are called as synchronized transmissions or constant mesh <coughs> transmission, wherein what happened is the following. The gear on the input shaft and the output shaft were now always meshed with each other. So, if I draw the gear on the input shaft, this is my gear on the input shaft. So, the gear on the input shaft and the gear on the output shaft were always in mesh with one another. Okay? So, that is the reason it is called as a constant mesh gearbox. Okay? However, the gear on the output shaft is mounted on bearings okay? on the output shaft. So, consequently although the output gear is always in mesh with the input gear and let us say if the engine is rotating and the clutch is engaged the input shaft will be rotating, the output gear will be rotating, but then the energy will not be transmitted from the output gear to the output shaft unless otherwise we utilize what is called as a collar. So, what is a collar? A collar is an element which have teeth projected on either side right which go and engage with teeth that are projected on the side of the output gear so what happens is that like when the driver uh, 
uh, what to say, uh, shifty, shifty gear engagement lever, this collar, <coughs> this element called as collar is moved, is slid along the output shaft and then it has to go and engage with the output gear through teeth on the side of the side surface of the collar and the output gear, fine. So, this although this is an improvement over unsynchronized transmission, this is still challenging because like once again the same problem persists, right. Because in general before the engagement is made, the output gear and the collar may be rotating at different speeds possible, right. So, then how was it solved? Even engaging a constant mesh transmission with a collar, you know required a good amount of skill from the driver, okay and good control over the throttle and the clutch pedal, okay. So, then what people thought of was the following, instead of having this collar directly engaging with the gear on the output shaft can we think of a mechanism where on the output gear I do have these teeth, but in addition I have a conical projection okay, which first meshes with a conical cavity on this collar okay, I, mean, I will come to this shortly right and then there are teeth on the side of this element which will then mesh with the teeth on the side of the gears. So, when this element is pushed against an output gear, the conical projection and the conical cavity will first come in contact with one another and obviously generally you know the RPMs or rotational speeds are going to be different to begin with. But once they come in contact with one another, they are going to initially slip, but then due to friction they are going to overcome the speed differential and once the speed differential is overcome, we go and engage the teeth on the side of the two elements, okay. So, this element with this arrangement is what is called as a synchronizer, <coughs> okay. The collar evolved into the synchronizer, okay. So, due to this reason some people say synchro mesh gearbox, okay, as a constant mesh gearbox that uses the synchronizer, okay. So, these are, this is how the a gearbox uh, which is used in manual transmissions evolved, right, from uh, unsynchronized where uh, the output gear had to be physically moved, displaced and then engaged with the input gear to constant mesh transmission with a the collar, then constant mesh transmission with a synchronizer, fine. So, this is the evolution of the uh, manual transmission. So, let us uh, look at these components uh, in more detail and we will look at their uh, operation also. <coughs> so, before we uh, discuss uh, the corresponding schematics. Let me uh, also point out what is the uh, uh, what to say configuration that we will be considering. So, in typical uh, if we considering consider a typical you know like a front engine mounted rear wheel driven vehicle. So, what happens is that like the uh, engine is mounted in the front and then like uh, energy is transmitted through the clutch then it comes to the gearbox. So, that is the configuration that we uh, looked at initially yesterday, right. So, if we consider a typical uh, front engine mounted rear wheel driven vehicle the transmission 
typically will have three shafts <coughs> okay. So, what are these three shafts? So, the first one is the input shaft which is connected to the engine through the clutch this is the first shaft. The second shaft is what is called as a counter shaft or lay shaft. So, <coughs> a counter shaft or a lay shaft is an intermediate shaft okay, which has uh, gears on them and then like it transmits the energy from the input to the output shaft. Okay, so, these are the typical uh, shafts which are found in a uh, gearbox with this configuration all right with this drive configuration. So, we can see uh, in this schematic that this is the input shaft and gear right. So, this is the input shaft. So, this is the counter shaft or lay shaft. and this is the output shaft. So, we can uh, immediately see that the gear which comes from the input shaft meshes with a gear on the lay shaft all the time. Okay. So, the rotation of the input shaft is transmitted to a rotation on the lay shaft and all these gears on the counter shaft are going to rotate at the same speed. <coughs> okay. So, because the counter shaft is going to rotate at a given speed. Right now, these gears on the counter shaft are meshed with the corresponding gears on the output shaft. So, depending on the gear ratio, the speed of rotation of the output gears would be different. So, if you look at output gear number one, output gear number two, right? So, the speed of rotation of output gears one and two would be different in general right but however they are mounted on bearings on the output shaft so as long as we don't engage one of the gears we are not going to transmit energy to the corresponding uh, output shaft so if i have to essentially select one of them what we do is that like we use what is called as a multi rail selector okay so we are going to shortly come and look at how a multi rail selector works but then if we drive a car all of us would be uh, what to say uh, uh, familiar with the gear selector lever right what we call as a stick shift lever right. So, we essentially select different gears. So, when we essentially are displacing that uh, gear selector lever through an appropriate mechanism this collar or synchronizer in modern transmissions right is shifted either to the right or to the left to engage with gears. 1 or gear 2. Okay, so, that is how this um, typical uh, gearbox works. Okay. Here we have considered only 2 gears. So, <coughs> in general we can see that one collar or synchronizer can be used to engage two gears right on the output shaft is not it because in this schematic we can see only one collar right <coughs> that same collar can be used to engage with either gear 1 or gear 2 at a at any given instant of time by either shifting it to the right or the left. Okay. So, each collar or synchronizer can be used to <coughs> engage with two gears on the output shaft. Okay. So, this is the uh, broad idea. <coughs>